123rd Street, so it's very crowded. So maybe let's all just sort of take a couple steps in so Carl doesn't have to scream at the top of his lungs. Um, this is the last address of Hugh Steers. Hugh is an incredible figurative painter, and Visual Aids is really excited to be publishing a catalog um, of his complete paintings um, this year and the next few months. It's going to be about 500 full-color images, hardcover. Wow. Wow. So keep an eye out for that. We'll have a mock-up of the book at the New York Art Book Fair in a couple of weeks. Um, so Hugh, there's going to be a lot of Hugh in the next year or so, um, which is really exciting. Um, and Carl George will be doing the reading today. Carl is a collagist, filmmaker, and curator. Hugh and Carl were best friends, art collaborators, sisters on the dance floor, and brothers in, in arms in the War on AIDS. Hugh Steers died March 1st, 1995, with his brother Burr, his friend Henry O, and me surrounding his bedside, holding his hand, speaking softly to him, after having fought so hard and for so long, he slipped away with one last breath, releasing his gentle soul into the world. Joseph Campbell said, the seed of the soul is there, where the inner and the outer worlds meet. Hugh, as a vibrant and hopeful young man, and as a burgeoning and brilliant artist, exemplified this idea better than anyone I've known. Being a secular humanist, or whatever, I don't believe in concepts like soul or spirit, but let's say for a minute I do. Then I would say the soul, our essential spirit, is each person's contribution, good, bad, or indifferent, to the human condition. It's how you live and it's what you leave behind. I believe you grappled with this idea throughout his brief life, and especially during his illness and demise. He said, so much of art is about the great climactic moment. My work is concerned with the in-between times that make up most of everyday life. I'm also fascinated with confronting the horror of existence, the discovery that you may never love someone, or get beyond a certain point, or realize certain aspirations. What I saw in Hugh's early work, which I consider his best, were tender depictions of gay men in quiet, intimate settings. A window into our world that had never been shown in this way, or painted in this classical style. Baltus, Briard, and Bonard, all of whom Hugh greatly admired, painted similar scenes of heterosexuality. Hugh did for gay men what they did for female beauty and sensuality. Previously, the only artwork specifically of gay men that I knew of was either hyperbolic and cartoon-like, like Tom of Finland or Paul Cadmus, objective or subjective, like David Hockney or Warhol, or pornographic. These were different, and I found them to be a revelation. I bought eight or nine of them, one at a time, for $75 each. And to both of us, both of us, that was a lot of money, but I had to have them. Hugh was thrilled. After each person purchase, we'd go up the martinis, cruise men, dance, and get plastered. So they became known as the martini suite. Those early pieces are deeply beautiful and poignant to me. I never tire of looking at them, and they mean something new each time I see them. They capture moments of intimacy between men without being literal or didactic, and they are done in a very rudimentary style, which is raw and revealing. They're not like the work that came later, where Hugh painted a guy in a hospital gown and high heels, an ivy bag and the bed and the fabric. Those came about as he was developing his ability to paint deep perspective, and more importantly, they were his attempt to make a strong political statement or visually depict his fear, his rage, his indignation, and the horror of his pending death. And for these reasons, they are enormously important. Mm. I helped him move into this building at a time when AIDS was rallying within his body and knocking him out. Many days, he was barely able to walk because of peripheral neuropathy. He had lost most of his beautiful curly brown hair and much of his mental facility. 
One day he insisted we shop for a chair, a club chair, something very something very specific, although he wasn't able to say exactly how. He asked me to find it, to buy it for him and to have it delivered. We looked through catalogs until he found one, like Goldilocks, that looked just right. It was delivered. He hated it. It was returned. Twelve minutes. <laughs> Things like this happened every day. We would take taxis most places as walking was impossible. He always insisted on paying and would get furious with me if I cried. I watched him hand lots of bills to taxi drivers who would inevitably count out the correct change and return all the rest. Real mentions those New York cab drivers. So much of my time now is spent remembering friends and lovers whose lives were ended, severed while just beginning this great ride. Ross Laycock and I went to McGill, me in art history and Ross in biochemistry. Then we moved to New York together in 1980. He met Felix Gonzalez Torres a few years later and I knew instantly their love affair was one for the ages. Brian Taylor, Valerie Karras, Brian Damage, Gordon Curdy, Richard Hoffman, James Asadley, Michael Messenger, the list is endless. And I have to be honest, the burden is crippling. Through his artwork and life, Hugh humanized AIDS and the awful and sometimes strangely hopeful ramifications of this disease. Hughes raised the bar of culpability and pointed an accusing finger at those whose willing inaction or callous reaction condemned so many to die, while making the void, the absence, the injustice, the stolen potential of this Holocaust heart-wrenchingly clear.